Welcome to His Side Podcast. I'm your host, Joshua Wyant, and whether you're a Christian, church volunteer, or a leader, this podcast is for you. We'll break down cultural issues, church topics, and just like the angel of the Lord in Joshua chapter 5, we will discuss His Side. Well, hi, and welcome to another mini-session. On today's episode, I will give you five reasons why I know Jesus Christ loves education. See, it was the winter of 2018, and I am fasting. Almost every year after the holidays, I like to go on a three-week fast. As a consultant, I don't believe I can offer churches much if they are just kidding me. Typically, I withdraw from watching TV, and I read, and I pray, and I seek the Lord's will. So, I'm about halfway through my fast, and I'm driving into work for a church I was the administrator for at the time. And on my usual drive-in, I pass a local school, the high school. And at this point, God does something to me he's never done before. And I will let you know what he did at the end of this episode. <clears throat> From my perspective, there seems to be an assault on education like never before in this country. You see, I come from a family of educators. My mother taught in a public school for 34 years. My sister currently teaches at two schools. One school is a public school she teaches online, and another one is a Christian private school that she teaches in person. I myself taught public school for seven years before God called me into the ministry. My last year teaching was 2012, and if you told me then, in many schools across the country, they would be teaching gender dysphoria, CRT, and promoting segregation, I would have thought you were crazy. Nevertheless, that is the direction we have gone without Christ. Well, I'm going to give you five reasons why I know, without a shadow of a doubt, Christ loves education. Number five, Christ himself was a rabbi. This was an official title of honor for Jewish pupils. Typically, they would use either master or rabbi. This translates down to the following. My great one, my honorable sir. When I researched it, I discovered rabbi was a title used by the Jews to address their teachers with honor when not actually addressing them. This means when addressing Jesus, his disciples would most likely call him master. When talking about him, they would then call him rabbi. Number four, the word wisdom is located in 222 verses of the Bible, 172 occurrences in the Old Testament and 50 in the New Testament. In order to do a proper exegesis in Scripture, it is always important to remember the law of firsts. See, I took a class in hermeneutics, which is a fancy word for teaching you the process of observation, interpretation, and application of the Bible. In this class, I was taught the law of firsts. This indicates the true meaning of a word in biblical text is when it was first used. Wisdom, interestingly enough, is first mentioned in Exodus chapter 28. It is here where God is speaking to Moses and giving instructions on how to make the priest's garments. In Exodus 28 verse 3, wisdom is in reference to the very Spirit of God. Wisdom is derived from the Hebrew word kwakam, to be wise, exceeding, to teach wisdom, make oneself wise or wiser. Number three. It's actually an interesting number. 246. 246 times a verse has the word teaching, learn, or knowledge in it. Interestingly enough, the first time the word teaching appears is in Exodus chapter 13. Moses is instructing the Israelite people the Feast of Unleavened Bread. This would serve as a reminder of how God brought them out of slavery in Egypt. The word teaching found in verse 9 is taken out of the Hebrew word Torah, which stands for the law, direction, instruction, or body of priestly direction. I don't think it's a coincidence that the first time teaching is used is to remind Israel how much God loved them 
and show them a way to celebrate the day their shame was removed and their joy was restored. Number two, light unto my path. In Psalm 119, verse 105, it states, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Early in this podcast, I talked about the direction we are heading in education. For roughly over 100 years now, we have been headed down the path John Dewey sent us on. John Dewey sent us on a progressive model. He was one of the fathers of pragmatism and essentially helped shift our school's philosophy toward a specialized but utterly dehumanized student. Remember that. We shifted away from a classic Christian model that produced such Western leaders as Thomas Jefferson, Abraham Lincoln, and Winston Churchill. And if you want a more modern candidate, look no further than Dr. Ben Carson. You see, the classic Christian education was produced by higher learning institutions such as Oxford, Cambridge, and Harvard. This model had a heritage of going clear back to the days of the Greek philosophers. But it was the Industrial Revolution, we had very smart people, who knew better. Previously mentioned, John Dewey was one of them. Here's a new name for you. Heather Wilson. This is interesting. You know what she does? Her job is to look over applicants to receive the prestigious Rhodes Scholarship Program. Listen to her evaluation of today's top applicants. Graduates coming out of the U.S., top universities are superficial scholars. Essentially, they are highly specialized and dehumanized, not well-rounded. Did you catch that word again? Dehumanized. Huh. The path we are headed on. All right. Number one. I began this podcast telling you about a personal experience I had in 2018. As I'm driving by our local high school, I feel the Holy Spirit presence fill up in my truck. I hear these words almost like they were screaming in my head, and I know it's not from me. I hear, look, look at this place. Do you see it? Do you see them? And I knew I was focusing on the high school. I love this place. I love the people of this place. I didn't really know how to process this information right away. I just prayed for the school, specifically the people of the school, and the leadership on down. Fast forward a few months later, almost half the school board resigns. Then, COVID happens. George Floyd. And suddenly our school is making radical changes, culminating in the teaching of gender dysphoria to my first grade son. where he came home and he tells me that he's frustrated and that his head feels foggy because they're teaching him weird things at school. He starts to share with me while we're shooting hoops. He says, "Um, Dan, I love being a boy because God made me that way and God doesn't make mistakes. At this point, I about lost it because I'm simultaneously furious at my son's school and I am so proud of him as a father. I couldn't have phrased it better myself. I can't believe how sharp my son is and how capable he is of handling things even when adults don't. I was so proud of him. See, unfortunately... That's the path we've been headed for a while without Christ. So ultimately what I chose to do is I sought God through prayer and I weighed my options. I took steps to protect my son, but I realized God was preparing me to understand that even though our local school is flawed and has sinful people with some really stupid ideas, he loves them. And I was going to need to forgive them and support them however I could. I would like to tell you I passed every test with flying colors, but I don't want to lie on my own podcast. 
Because I believe presently we have some critical choices to make as a society when it comes to education. I'm going to break down some numbers for you. There are 168 hours in a week, and according to some recent polls, here's a percentage breakdown of Christian children and how they spend their time. 33% of that time is spent sleeping. 21% of that time at school or a school-related activity. 1.4% of that time is family time. And 1.2% of that time is spent with their youth group or a Christian-based activity. C.S. Lewis has said, When we have lost our way, the best way forward is home. I think we need to look back to our past when it comes to educating our children. Let's look at the classic Christian model that produces more well-rounded students and has proven results. In the show notes, I'm going to have graphics that will show you the differences between the progressive model and the classic Christian model. Lastly, if I were you, I would pray about what it is you can do to support your local schools. For me, the answer was increasing the amount of time I was spending volunteering. I wanted them to get to know me as a person. I wanted to get to know them as a person. And I wanted to thank them with my time for what they do for my children. That is the place to start. That is a place where unity can be established. And that is a place where I can build credibility in case I have a concern in the future and I need to talk to board members, superintendents, and so on and so forth. You see, there was a lot of movement a while back with Christians to pull their children out of public schools instead of fight for them. Now, I am not casting disparaging remarks on people that homeschool. Full disclosure, my wife was a product of that, and she is phenomenal. I'm a huge fan. I know many well-rounded, very sharp students that were homeschooled. My issue is not at all with the quality of education they get. The only thing I would do to challenge the process is this. When I read my Bible, Christ did not call us to isolate, but to infiltrate. Psalms 127 verse 4 says, Children born to a young man are like arrows in a warrior's hand. Remember, one thing is true. Not everyone has the same level of influence, but everyone does have influence. And I want to hear how you are fighting for his side. Until next time, I'm Joshua, and thank you for listening. I see a sky